Well, the top story this evening, there's fresh trouble for Chanda Kochar, the former managing director and CEO of ICICI Bank. The Central Bureau of Investigation has registered an FIR against Chanda, her husband Deepak Kochar, who is the MD of NU Power Renewables, and Venugopal Dhut, the managing director of Vidicon Group. Now, Vidicon Industries has also been named in the FIR. The FIR comes in connection with the CBI, probing allegations of ICICI Bank granting a loan to the Vidicon Group on a quid pro quo basis. Parishit Lutra is here with the details. Parishit, uh, take us through the details of the CBI FIR. The CBI also carrying out raids in as many as four locations across Mumbai and Aurangabad. That's right. Uh, the CBI has finally filed an FIR against Chanda Kochar, her husband Deepak Kochar, and also against uh, Videocon Industries, New Power Renewables, and VN Dhut. Uh, this is all based on a preliminary inquiry report that was uh, made by the CBI. Remember, this inquiry began uh, in uh, in December 2017, and uh, on the basis of that, the CBI has registered an FIR where they said that six high-value loans were made uh, to a Videocon group of companies by ICICI Bank when uh, Ashanda Kochar was at the helm of affairs. They also said that she, as a member of the sanctioning committee, abused her official position, received illegal gratification, and sanctioned these loans. Uh, it also goes on to say that in the month, uh, in the year 20, uh, in, the, in the year 2009, within a span of two days, 70 crores uh, went to uh, New Power Renewables from Videocon, and 300 crores were sanctioned towards uh, Videocon Group of Companies. And since then, there were a series of loans that were sanctioned uh, by Chanda Kochar uh, as a member of the sanctioning committee. The report also goes on to say that while a case needs to be registered against eight people in total, including unknown uh, government servants and private uh, officials, uh, the role of members of the sanctioning committee may also be investigated in future. It does not mention them as an accused, but says that their role must also be investigated. All right, Pariksha, thanks for breaking that down for us. Uh, now, here's a big exclusive from Davos. Delay in SR Steel's insolvency case is costing PSU Bank 17 crore rupees a day. That's the word coming in from Arsala Mittal's Aditya Mittal. Speaking exclusively to CNBC TV 18, Shireen Bhan on the sidelines of the World Economic Summit in Davos, Mittal rubbish the idea that there is need of a revised offer on the backdrop of new bids by Ruiyas. Mittal, however, expressed optimism that SR Steel resolution is headed for a good conclusion despite the delay in the IBC process. Let me ask you about whether you were surprised about State Bank of India's decision to put that 15,500 crores of the SR Steel exposure on the block. Of course, the deadline for that has now been extended. How do you see that playing out and what the implications could be on the IBC process? I think that's uh, another demonstration why uh, the process needs to come to a logical conclusion mm. and a speedy conclusion, mm. right? The state banks are losing 17 crores a day, okay? That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money for India. They can utilize those funds, uh, redeploy it to enhance liquidity in the country, redeploy it, give loans, and, and boost growth. Mm. Uh, yet instead, uh, because of all of these actions and, and delay tactics, they're, they're requesting bids at an 18% discount mm. to our offer, mm. right? 18% discount. That's a lot of money that's being put on the table. And, and that's why it's very important that the core processes and, and the rule-based IBC is implemented because mm. otherwise, in the big picture, the country is losing a lot of value. You know, you talked about value maximization. And I go back to the statement that came in from SR Steel saying that their offer is uh, in line with the objective of the IBC to enhance value maximization, not just for lenders, but also for operational creditors. And their offer is better than the resolution plan that was cleared, uh, 12,000 crore rupees better. How do you respond to that? Uh, so that's very interesting because uh, when you read the media reports, the first offer that they made was 20,000 crores, mm. right? So if it wasn't for our... Now in excess of 54,000 No, but if you, if you go back to day one, yeah. it was 20,000 yeah. crores, right? But now I'm talking about now the revised yeah. offer. So, okay, so let's talk about the revised offer. You have to follow a rule-based process, and, and that's what, what my answer was going to be. Because if you, if you do not follow a rule-based process, mm. uh, companies like us and others will not participate if there's a promoter bidding for a company. Mm. Then what you would have seen is that SR Steel would have been sold to New Metal slash Ruyas for 20,000 crores. Mm. That would have been a massive loss. And then future bad loans, future companies which uh, are not able to service the debt, mm. the promoters would come back and buy it back at a discount because the SR Steel would demonstrate that you don't have to follow the rules. Mm. So it's not just about so our you, case. So you believe that this is a subversion of the IBC? 
Yeah, absolutely, right? Because the IBC process was very clear. The courts were very clear. Mm. There were chances to submit bids. I mean, we all know this is not a yeah. process we started yesterday, yeah. right? Yeah. It's almost two years. Yeah. And so now suddenly, uh, COC has decided, they've chose the winning bid to come in at the last moment. I, I mean, I don't even think the bid is financed. There's no guarantees. Mm. There's no penalties because in the IBC process, you provide guarantees. You, If you forfeit your bid, you know, mm. all of those things are there. Mm. So, uh, so it's unfortunate development and clearly the courts will take the right decision. I have a lot of faith in, in a rule-based economy as India huh. and, 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 and that should be the logical conclusion. You know, I, I, th that's the point of view of SR, but that point of view has also been bolstered by somebody like Sajjan Jindal, also perhaps an interested party in some senses, or at least was in the previous avatar of the, of the bid with new metal. Uh, what do you make of Sajjan Jindal saying that, look, the SR uh, family should get the right to, to go through with this if they can finance it? Look, I think all, all promoters uh, have the right uh, to buy back their companies by paying back 100 cents on the dollar, but not 540 days later, mm. right? They should, first of all, not allow the company to go under, right? That's the first, first requirement. And if the company has gone under, try and find a solution as soon as you can. Uh, to c first submit a bid of 20,000 and then, you know, mess around with the process, I don't think is, is a promoter trying to act in the best interest of creditors. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a possibility at all, uh, and we saw this play out as far as ASA law is concerned, uh, that there was a last minute sweetening of the offer. Is that a possibility that you would consider, given the fact that SR uh, continues to bring up the, po the fact that there is a 12,000 crore rupee difference between what they're offering and your offer? Look, I think we've gone through 540 days. I, I think what the banks are really focused on is, is coming to the right conclusion. Mm. Uh, the right but is conclusion. this even a possibility, a, a revised offer on your part? I, I, there's no need, right? The COC has taken a decision. We're in the courts to approve the resolution plan. So uh, at, at this point in time, I think our bid, if you just looked at the scoring when, mm. when the bids were open, was far in excess of anything on the table. Mm -hmm. and, and today the banks are willing to sell at a discount to our bid. So I think the discussion is not about the bid. The discussion is really about the process. the process, making sure that the employees of SR Steel have a clear future, making sure that we can make the investments, improve the business, grow the business, and, and bring in our capabilities to India. All right, speaking of SR Steel, KC told you first, and it's official now, SBI has extended the deadline for sale of its SR Steel loans. The lender has extended the deadline for the submission of bids to 30th of January and has pushed the e-bidding deadline to the 11th of February. Remember, SBI has a total exposure of over 15,000 crore rupees to SR Steel. On to some key appointments in India, Inc. Yes Bank is set to get its first non-promoter CEO from the 1st of March. Ravneet Gill, who is currently heading Deutsche Bank's operations in India, will take over the corner office at Yes Bank. The bank stock, in fact, rallied about 9%, even after reporting a worsening of asset quality in the third quarter due to a 2,500 crore rupee exposure to ILNFS. Ritu Singh is here with more details. Ritu, a new era clearly era at Yes Bank. Ravneet Gill, the India head for Deutsche Bank, has been named the MD and CEO of Yes Bank, effective 1st of March 2019. However, do remember, Rana Kapoor, the current CEO, has to step down by the 31st of January, that is the end of this month, and therefore the 29th of January board meeting that the bank is set to hold is going to be crucial to decide what the interim phase of transition is going to be, whether an interim CEO would have to be named. That is something uh, that will be decided in that 29th of January board meeting. Now, Ravneet Gill, of course, brings with him almost three decades of banking experience and his last role was uh, you know as the India head of Deutsche Bank which he joined back in 2012 uh, lots of key challenges that he'll have to face when he joins the bank but you know as far as the third quarter numbers are concerned it was a miss on the profits uh, which declined by about seven percent over the previous year largely on account of the slippages that the bank had in their island FS exposure gross NPs jumped to 2.1 percent in this quarter and net NPs to 1.18 percent and the fresh slippages which is the fresh addition to bad loans was at 2,297 crore rupees, of which about 1,913 crores was only an account of uh, the island FS exposure, which has now been classified bad. The remaining exposure of the total 2,530 uh, crore rupees remains standard, but a 15% provisioning has been made on that as well. And the credit cost guidance has been upped to about 80 basis points for the entire financial year.
All right, Ritu, thanks for that. We're continuing with appointments. Indigo has appointed Ronajoy Datta as its CEO with immediate effect. Ronajoy had joined the airline as a principal consultant in December last year. Anu Sharma is here with the details. Uh, anu, take us through Ronajoy Datta's street credentials and also a background of uh, the changes that we have seen that led to Ronajoy being appointed. Uh, right. So, a clear signal coming in from Indigo uh, that 2019 will be a year of aggressive international expansion. Uh, with the, his appointment uh, and he being an uh, aviation veteran, uh, Indigo is giving a clear signal that uh, that uh, 2019 with the incoming NEOs, uh, the long-range larger AC-21 NEOs, uh, 2019 will see a lot of expansion on that front. Uh, Datta is, of course, not a stranger to the aviation space. He has been with the U.S. giant United Airlines for 17 years also served as its president for nearly four years. He's also headed Air Sahara uh, in the mid-2000s. Uh, he has also been a strategic, strategic advisor for Air Canada Hawaiian Airlines. So this announcement only makes sense for Indigo uh, at this point of time. And uh, remember, Datta was brought to uh, Indigo's team in December to frame a five-year international plan. And uh, uh, with a substantial man uh, part of the management now having uh, international experience, it remains to be seen what Indigo has in store for us. Quick look at the last street uh, today. After a steep fall in yesterday's session, markets took a breather and ended with slim gains. So Nifty saw a sharp recovery in the last hour to end just shy of the 10,850 mark. Sensex also ended just below the 36,200 marks. Banks ended flat with a positive bias led by a sharp uptick seen in Yes Bank and we told you why just a short while ago. Mid-caps underperformed today. The index ended about three-tenths of a percent in the red. On to an exclusive then, uh, we learned from sources that Japanese multinational Sony Entertainment is in talks to pick up stake in Z Entertainment. Remember, over Diwali weekend last year, the promoters informed exchanges that they are looking to sell up to half of their shareholding in the company. Nisha Poddar, who broke that story, is here with the details. Nisha, which companies have shown interest to buy stake in Z? It's still early days when it comes to Z Entertainment transaction, but sources with direct knowledge share with CNBC TV 18 that Sony, a large Japanese uh, multinational conglomerate, has evinced interest in buying out stake in uh, Z Entertainment. Part or full, those negotiations are going on right now. But remember that uh, Sony Entertainment Television or Set India is the only meaningful broadcasting business by Sony, the multinational firm, in uh, the world. So in India, as a geography, is the only space in which they have a large broadcasting network and they could be looking at beefing it up. Now remember that Sony had lost out um, in the battle for 21st Century Fox which was up for sale, lost it out to Disney overseas and Fox operates, remember, Star uh, Network here in India. So if not Star, it could be looking at Z Entertainment as an option to beef up its broadcast television business here in India. So that's one of the contenders but American firm Comcast is also looking at a bigger, larger pie in India as well as uh, Tencent and uh, Alibaba, the Chinese investors could look at it. And Amazon for the over-the-top video services that Z Entertainment offers, that could be one of the attractions for Amazon. So this particular deal talks are, is going on right now. The final uh, first round of bids could be expected in the next few days to come. Okay, Nisha, thanks for that. Let's get you some of the other business uh, headlines that we are tracking today. Piyush Goyal took charge as Interim Finance Minister. Today, Goyal assumed charge as Arun Jaitley underwent a surgery in US and has been advised two week rest. With just a week to go before interim budget, Goyal is expected to present in the budget in Jaitley's absence. Remember, this is the second time that Goyal has taken charge as Interim Finance Minister in May 2018 when Jaitley underwent a kidney transplant. PM Modi-led selection committee is expected to meet this evening to discuss the appointment of the next CBI director. Sources tell CNBC TV18 that the centre has shortlisted names of 12 to 15 IPS officers for the CBI top job. Clean recall, seniority, tenure on CBI and an experience in handling anti-corruption and criminal cases are the criteria set for the appointment. There's more trouble for Akhilesh Yadav. The Gumti River Front Development Project in Lucknow that was approved by him has come under lens for alleged money laundering. The Enforcement Directorate has conducted raids across 10 places in Delhi, Haryana, Rajasthan and Uttar Pradesh. The ED raids have come just a couple of weeks after the CBI raids in the illegal mining case. Well, let's go back across to Davos where Shireen Bhan is in conversation with Karan Johar. Take a look.
Hello and welcome to the CNBC TV 18 special. We continue our coverage here from the World Economic Forum in Davos. And joining me now is Karan Johar, who has become quite the Davos regular. Uh, Karan, thanks very much for joining us back All here right. on, on the program. What's been the highlight this year? Well, we had an exciting session yesterday. It was the first session that I attended uh, and that I was on the panel for was violence against women. It was very interesting. It was insightful. It was awakening. And it was a very emotional session, I thought. A very relevant topic that was addressed by some very strong, um, you know, strong minds. And I just thought that there was a pulsating energy. It was an open forum. So mm. there was a lot of the, the Swiss people who were part of it. And, you know, there, it was just a very engaging, engaging and wonderful session. We went live, so I'm sure people must have caught it. It was really a relevant, interesting and engaging conversation. You know, speaking of relevant, interesting and engaging conversations, and since you did this session here on uh, violence against women, uh, the criticism, especially of Bollywood back home, is uh, is the commoditization of women, of not treating women as they ought to be, of not being uh, sort of in with the times, so to speak. Do you believe that, uh, you know, that there is an effort now to reinvent there's a huge effort and this huge accountability. I mean, I've been, uh, I mean, I have to say that I, I uh, have been responsible myself for some mm -hmm. of the objectification. I I'm glad that you said that. Yes. There have been song sequences uh, that I've, we've had that, you know, we have grown up w in the DNA and the fabric of Indian cinema and don't realize that some of what we do mm -hmm. has repercussions and ramifications on society around us. Mm -hmm. For example, if we do an item song and I, all, not all item songs are objectionable or are uh, objectifying. Uh, some are celebration songs, which are absolutely fine. But the ones where they have men around one woman in particular, um, you know, with a certain kind of attitude, mm. which I think, you know, you know, it kind of propagates that objectification. That is something that I have stopped doing altogether. Mm. I've done it in films and I've apologized. And I've said, you know, I didn't realize as a filmmaker that I'm accountable and responsible to the fabric of our society. And some of that has stopped. A lot of the accountability has begun as a result of the, you know, the social media policing, social, Me too. you know, the, the Me Too movement, um, rightfully so. Every filmmaker is now much more correct in his or her endeavor to communicate what they need to. Also characters of women who are an empowered force now in cinema, mm. you know, they're standing tall in terms of the work they're doing, the power they kind of yield in cinema. And just the way I think filmmakers are projecting women on screen has changed drastically. You know, there was, uh, of course, a criticism, and of course it was valid, that at a time that women weren't given uh, their place in mm -hmm. cinema. But today, it's, if you see the films that have worked in the last couple of years, women walk tall, stand tall, and are largely responsible for the success of those films. So it's becoming, well, I'm saying that there is, of course, a constant battle for equality, mm -hmm. but I have to say that cinema has upped its game. Indian cinema has upped its game. But is it largely on account of self-enlightenment, or is it because of backlash from the public, from the consumer? Of course it's as a result of backlash. That's what so happens. There is no self-enlightenment. No. Self-enlightenment is a result of the backlash. Mm. Sometimes what happens is when you start hearing these kind of comments, thoughts, blogs, uh, you know, columns written, books written, just thoughts that are put out there, you start realizing that what you've been doing, like stalking, which we thought was romantic, mm. a man chasing a woman constantly and her finally, you know, you know, kind of relenting and calling that love, is something that was called romance in Indian cinema. Mm. Then filmmakers took a step back and said that is actually stalking and that you're giving a reason to, for men on, on, uh, out there to kind of do the very same, mm -hmm. it's not okay. You can't be stalking a woman, you know, and think it's okay. We had romanticized it on mm -hmm. screen mm -hmm. and thought it was okay. It was always like, you know, like, you know, like literally na 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 and then finally ha. And mm -hmm. that, that became like the order of Indian romance. Mm -hmm. Now that's no longer the case in cinema. Now everybody's thinking a hundred times before they even put out a scene like that because there is accountability. The enlightenment has come as a result of the backlash. You know, speaking of backlash, I want to pick up on the latest apology uh, that you've issued, uh, and this has to do with the episode of Coffee with Karan with Hardik Pandya. And uh, uh, did you did you did you not feel uncomfortable at the time that that episode was being shot uh, with, during the course of that conversation? Was there no sense of discomfort with what went on there? You know, when you're hosting the show, mm. you have so many things that you're doing. You know, you have five segments that you're going from one to the other. It's conversation. Very often, I've watched a show of mine much later and said, oh, I, 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 what was I thinking when I said that? And what was going through my mind? A lot of times, you know, your, your subconscious mind just kind of shuts down and the host in you takes over. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. I, I have to say I'd be lying if I tell you that I felt uncomfortable. No, I wasn't. And I know that that's 
an unfortunate thing for me to say because there were some uncomfortable things, of course, said, and I've taken complete responsibility because those questions were asked by me. Mm. I am responsible for what was asked on Coffee with Karan, and if that has offended people, I've apologized because that was never my intention. My show has always been a bit of a frivolous, completely irreverent, casual, candid, sometimes edgy show that is not necessarily meant for people who have um, uh, some kind of a, a serious agenda to watch. Well, you know, this is not about being, uh, this is not about serious agenda. Yeah, I mean, this is going back course. to the conversation that we just had about the commodification of yes. women. It was, and I think that things went out of uh, out of hand, perhaps. And it was not something that crossed my hand in my mind immediately. Mm. I would be lying if I said it did, and that perhaps is something I have to correct about myself. Mm. Um, I'm so was the apology also because of the backlash? Yes, of course. No, it was. Had you not given me that backlash, if there wasn't that backlash, I may have thought it was okay, and it's perhaps not okay. And I think the boys have paid the price for it, and I really hope that they can get back to playing cricket because I think they have basically been punished, and uh, as have I. And it's something that made me sit back and reflect. And I had a conversation with my mother right after the show. And she says, maybe you should have thought twice mm. before you put out the show. And I said, maybe I should have. But the irony is that I was uh, surrounded around women, none of whom came up to me and said anything. And they all said, great fun, good, crazy, mad. No one came and said objectionable to me. And I perhaps thought that it was then OK. The mistake is entirely mine. It is mm. not theirs. Because I'm the host. I'm the older one. Mm. I'm the more responsible person on that show. I should have actually second guessed what happened, probably curtailed it, controlled yeah. it, stopped yeah. it. I didn't, I didn't realize it, and that's why I'm completely apologetic about what happened. Mm. You know, in light of what you've seen happen, uh, and you talked about how you're much more aware of what you put out uh, by way of your films, because you believe that the unintended consequences are now starting to have an impact on not just your careers, but the careers of the people involved with the making of those movies as well. Or this episode with Coffee with Karan. How is that rewiring the way that you go into a project, or that you deal with your content? Well, you have to kind of constantly rewire yourself to be relevant with the times. You know, you have to understand what's happening around you, the environment, the politics of the time, the social fabric of the time, what's happening, the mindset. When I made movies way back in the 90s, things were very different. I have, I'm one of those few filmmakers that have made the transformation from that age that was not social media heavy or accountable heavy mm -hmm. to now an environment that is exceptionally accountable and thank God for that. Because a lot has changed and a lot has become stronger. So how am I rewiring it? By constantly being aware. Awareness is the best way to be rewired. If I'm going to just clamp down and say what I did was right and get defensive about it, then I'm not really, really going ahead and going forward as a human being or as a filmmaker. I'm somebody who wants to constantly be relevant, not in terms of just the work I do or the creativity of the films I make, but also relevant in terms of adhering to the social fabric and the society fabric of our time. Mm. You know, you talked about uh, politics uh, and adhering to the politics of the time as well. So let me ask you about uh, what is being seen as a very obvious politicization of Bollywood. Uh, you know, yes, the Producers Guild met with the Prime Minister. You had a list of demands. Some of those demands have actually been taken forward uh, by way of action, GST being the big one where the cut has come in. But then there's been this other meeting with, with the young actors meeting with the Prime Minister. There's been these films, uh, Accidental Prime Minister. Uh, you know, there's... There's questions being raised on a politicization, Bollywood sort of playing almost court, court jester to the current administration. How do you respond to that? I think it's very easy for people on the other side to just form opinions. We're an industry. We've never been a politically run industry base. Yes, there have been some actors that or some members of the film fraternity who've that have, gone into that have politics, entered politics yeah. but largely, and I would say 90% of us, are apolitical in nature. We are liberal in nature. We are creative. We are for our industry and the needs and demands of our industry. We, as an industry, went to the powers to be to ask for certain things that would enhance and empower us. Those elements were incorporated into the fabric of, of, of rules and regulations, and things have happened. Uh, whether it's the reduction of uh, rate vis-a-vis -vis the GST, uh, then there is a single window clearance. We've asked for stringent laws against piracy. Mm -hmm. All that is in motion. So there are two ways of looking at it. You could look at, look at it as a, politi uh, you know, uh, a whole political move made, and their Bollywood is being used. Or you could say that Bollywood is actually being helped. And I'm an optimist, and I'm positive, and that's how I'm going to look at the latter and I'm not going to say that you know we were
Okay, that was Karan Johar on a whole host of issues. We will bring you more uh, corporate coverage uh, across uh, the next couple of hours uh, from the World Economic Forum. But completely out of time on this edition of uh, Reporter Sari. Many thanks for watching. Stay tuned though. CNBC TV 18's What the World Wants is coming up next. Stay right there.